Ladies and gentlemen, please once again welcome to the stage Deacon Anthony C.O. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back. It's been a great morning. It's been a great early afternoon. How were your breakouts? Excellent. As I walked around, I heard so much energy and enthusiasm coming out of the breakout rooms. I actually went into one and asked them to keep it down. As I walked out, I saw the name on the board was Unstoppable Joy. Only I can, unstop I can stop people's joy. Before I begin, I do want to announce we have a special guest with us today. Bishop Galante is here with us today, our Bishop Emeritus. Okay. Thank you so much for being here with us today. We continue to come together to hear about how we are to become missionary disciples, how we are to share our faith, and how we are to do it, do it in new and exciting ways. I am so excited to be able to welcome our special guest today, Cardinal Joseph Tobin who will speak to us about Pope Francis's vision of the joy of the gospel, our call to missionary discipleship, and the related themes of encounter and accompaniment. He is the Cardinal Archbishop of Newark, New Jersey, appointed by Pope Francis in 2016, and he previously served as the Archbishop of Indianapolis. Cardinal, Cardinal Tobin professed vows as a member of the Redemptorist in 1973, and he was ordained in 78. He also served as Superior General of the Redemptorist from 97 to 2009. Please join me in welcoming Cardinal Archbishop Joseph Tobin. Thanks very much. I always believe the people that clap before they hear you speak <laughs> are very kind. Now, if I begin by saying something like, friends, I'm really happy to be with you today, you're probably saying, yeah, you always say that. I really am. It's made a difference in what, how I plan this talk. I was thinking, oh, few months ago about an email that I got from a place where I, the last time I really worked honestly in the church, I was a pastor <laughs> on the north side of Chicago. And the people of that parish still keep me in mind. They will send me the news about who won the turkey at the raffle and who got married, who got buried. And this particular email I got was from a young father dad, who I think was an altar boy when I was the pastor, and he was telling me about a walk home from church one Sunday with his seven-year-old son. The dad's name is Tom, and the young boy's name is Sam. And the dad was walking along trying to figure out what father was talking about in the homily. Imagine that. And so he turned to Sam and he said, Sam, who do you think Father was talking about, to, talking to this morning? Was he talking to the grown-ups or was he talking to the little kids? So Sam thought that over. Now he's seven years old. He's going to make his first communion. So he's watching everything. So he, he thought and then he looked up with a big smile and he said, I think he was talking to himself. And I think most of the people dressed like this, and maybe a deacon or two, if you're honest, you say, yeah, that's an occupational hazard. <laughs> that we get up with all sorts of good intentions, and we end up talking to ourselves. Now, let me explain to you why 
this has made a difference in how I feel. I don't want to talk to myself. Because that theme that I saw, you know, proclaiming the good news, missionary discipleship in South Jersey is so important. It's crucial for the church. You may root for the wrong football team on Sundays. But you're absolutely crucial to the church. So I'd like to offer a modest uh, reflection on Pope Francis's understanding of evangelization. And the question I'm asking myself is this. How is the church to witness to the gospel at this time that's been called a change of era, turbulent times, time of tribulation, of suffering, of embarrassment for the church, and trying to proclaim good news still in a world that itself is in flux. I want to share some insights from serving the church during this remarkable pontificate. I always said, Francis is a friend, but Francis is also a teacher. And what he's teaching me still is how to be a bishop. Now, let me tell you why Francis, well, how he would view this assembly this afternoon. This is my second favorite Pope Francis story. I'll get to the favorite one in a little while. But a couple years ago on a Wednesday morning before the weekly audience in St. Peter's Square, Francis was riding, doing a couple laps of the piazza in his Pope mobile, and he saw a group of people holding up a container with a metal straw in it. And he recognized, or at least he thought he knew what it was, it's a type of tea that Argentinians really like, yerba mate. And so they were offering it to him. It's always a communal event. You never, not everybody gets their own cup of tea, as my grandmother from Kerry would say. You share the same one. So when they handed it to him, he took it and took a couple slurps and gave it back. And the security went nuts. <laughs> and afterwards, they said, you can't do that. This is a dangerous world. If they offer you a pizza pizza, you don't eat it. If they offer you whatever was in that cup, don't drink it. It's a dangerous world. And he held up his hand and he said, those people were Argentinians. They weren't cardinals. <laughs> So, to put Francis at ease, I'm speaking today as a missionary disciple, <laughs> not as a cardinal. <laughs> How can we describe a missionary disciple? I, I like to take a few verses out of the Gospel of Mark, the third chapter, beginning, I think, around the 16th verse. And it says, Jesus went up on the mountain and sat down. And he called to himself those whom he wanted for two reasons. To be with him and to be sent out to preach. And if you say, what's a missionary disciple? It's a person who lives conscious of those two things. That Jesus has called me first to be with him, not to do a bunch of stuff, to be with him and is conscious of being sent to preach. Jesus called those whom he wanted to be with him and to be sent out to preach. This is what we mean by a missionary disciple. And Francis is describing this reality because of his own experience, not only as a missionary disciple, but as a bishop in Latin America. He had a number of a lifetime of pastoral experience, but it really crystallized in a moment in 2008 when the bishops of Latin America, as a body, came together in a Brazilian town called Aparecida, about halfway between Sao Paulo and Rio, the site of the great Marian shrine, the patroness of Brazil, Our Lady of Aparecida. 
And during a month of reflection, they thought about what it means to be a missionary disciple. And we'll get to that in a second. But what, what's it about? Well, Francis is speaking not simply to Catholics. From his election, what is it now, six years ago this month, where he's taking possession. He's spoken to all sorts of people, believers and unbelievers, Christians and non-Christians. But as, as Deacon mentioned, I used to inflict myself on the people of God in Indianapolis. And the principal church in that state, in Indiana, is the Methodist church. And I would get together with the other religious leaders on the second Thursday of the month, 8 o'clock in the morning, coffee and donuts. I used to be quite svelte, but <laughs> those ecumenical gatherings will do you in. And after one of them, it's a time of sharing, a time of prayer, the Methodist bishop, Mike Conn, came up to me and he said, we have a gathering every spring in Indianapolis for all the ministers and their spouses in the state of Indiana, about a thousand people. He said, would you talk at it? I said, sure. Same reason I gave to Bishop Sullivan. They'll appreciate you a lot more when I get done with them. <laughs> I said, Mike, what do you want me to talk about? Now, this is spring of 2013. He says, no, excuse me, 2014. He says, well, they'd, they'd like to hear about Pope Francis. They're quite interested in Pope Francis. So I prepared a little talk, and thank God I had prepared something because I found out when I got there, all three days of their conference was about Pope Francis. And it was the theme of the three days was an outward-looking church. And after I spoke, a young minister from northern Indiana and his wife got up, and they led the assembly in three moments of reflection and then prayer on the priorities of Pope Francis. Imagine that. Methodists get, getting together to talk about the priorities of the Bishop of Rome. Well, they're easy to remember. It's just like Methodists, they begin with an M. Maybe that's the way they do it, I don't know. What are the three priorities? Well, they're what I'd like to talk about today. Mission, mercy, and margins. I think if you want to begin to glimpse of what the difference Pope Francis is making, those three M's are absolutely crucial to any discussion. Mission, mercy, and margins. Let's start with the first one, mission. The church, that's all of us, are not people who have a mission. There are people who are a mission. And the purpose of the mission is not simply to fill the pews, but to enable an encounter with God, with the God of mercy. And the place for that encounter, for most people, is in their own lives, especially in their needs and their anguish. Now this is a key idea for Pope Francis. So it's the product of a lifetime of pastoral work, but it was crystallized in that moment in 2008, May of 2008, when was celebrated the fifth meeting or general assembly of the bishops of Latin America and the Caribbean. It met from the 13th to the 31st of May, and the theme was discipleship, disciples and missionaries disciples and missionaries of Jesus Christ, so that our people may have life in him. I am the way, the truth, and the life. This theme required a mental shift on the part of many of the bishops who took part. Aparecida, that conference, noted how the Christian church came into existence 2,000 years before in a context that was very similar to our own context, especially if you're from Newark or from Camden or Sao Paulo and Rio. It came to birth in major cities. 
in a culture of pluralism. Christianity wasn't back then a powerful civic institution seeking influence in circles of power. Christ followers, in fact, were often hounded, persecuted, and killed. Yet faith spread rapidly through those chaotic cities because their faith allowed them to see God alive in his people, and especially those on the margins. And they went out to meet him there. What a parasita expressed was a desire to return to that attitude that planted the, the faith in the beginnings of the church, to embrace the idea of mission not as simply an activity or program or strategy or workshop, but rather a way of being. When it talked about mission, a parasita used words like this, permanent, not one week and done, and paradigmatic, that it was something that was give, going to give a direction to the whole of life. Not just for those outside the church, those people out there, but also for us who are inside. In going out on mission, in fact, the church itself is converted and evangelized. It's spelled out beautifully in the joy of the gospel. The people of God, Francis wrote, evangelizes itself. In this way of thinking, the parish isn't just a group of buildings or a Sunday assembly, but ties among those who make up its community, some of whom will be baptized mass goers. A parasita called for a church visibly present as a mother who welcomes her children home, a constant school of missionary communion. Those were the words of the Cardinal Archbishop of Buenos Aires when he went home after the conference. Cardinal Bergoglio, Jorge to his friends. A parasita also spoke of the encounter outside the church, so to speak, and popular culture and always among the poor. Evangelization is not proselytism. Its purpose is not to recover a market share or fill the pews. It's not a matter of plans and programs, of strategies, tactics, maneuvers, techniques, as if all depended upon us, the evangelizers. Francis said as much in 2015 in Asuncion, Paraguay. You do not convince people with arguments, strategies, or tactics. You convince them by learning how to simply welcome them. Jesus didn't proselytize. He accompanied. Closeness, says Francis. That's the program. Closeness. The second M, mercy. A few months after the conference at Aparacida, Cardinal Bergoglio gave an interview in Rome to the magazine 30 Days, or 30 Giorni, in which he said the church should not be afraid to depend solely on the tenderness of God. In a world largely deaf to the church's words, he said only the presence of a God who loves and saves us will catch people's attention adding that the church's evangelizing fervor would return insofar as it witnessed to the one who loved us first. Now he makes that point with one of my favorite books in the Bible, the book of Jonah. You remember the story of Jonah, the reluctant prophet. He's famous for being swallowed and then thrown up by a whale. You remember why he got swallowed by the whale. He was on his way, according to God's mission, to Tarshish. Well, he, excuse me, to, he was heading to Tarshish, fleeing his mission, fleeing God's instruction to evangelize the highly wicked city of Nineveh. What Jonah was really fleeing, said Cardinal Bergoglio, was God's mercy, which was unacceptable to him. For Jonah was the classic devout and religious person, quick to anger and poor in mercy. And for him, the world was divided clearly 
into two groups, the righteous and the unrighteous. And we might well imagine that the first group was much smaller than the, the, for the latter group. In the same way, said Bergoglio, there were nowadays those who flee from the closed, those who from the closed world of their Tarshish complain about everything, feeling their identity threatened, launch themselves into battles, only to, in the end, to be still more self-focused and self-referential. As a descriptive of the defensive, moralistic Catholicism of the time, it can hardly be improved on. Francis spelled out the challenge in the strongest possible terms. Perhaps we have forgot, long forgotten how to show and live the way of mercy, he wrote in his letter at the end of the year, Jubilee of Mercy, Misericordia Voltis, Voltus, the face of mercy. The church's very credibility was at stake in its acceptance or re resistance of this need for conversion for it had fallen into the mindset of Jonah. Francis' mission had been to restore mercy to the forefront of the church's proclamation, to bring into the first paragraph the very message of Christianity, which somehow got buried on page 16. In that letter, The Face of Mercy, Francis quoted St. John Paul II, that contemporary technocracy had no room for mercy. But this begs the question, if Western culture was now being detached from its Christian roots and reverting to paganism as the widespread practice of abortion and divorce or a sink and swim economy that trusts only in human and material power suggested, why wasn't the church exploding with converts and vocations? Why was it not notorious for its mercy, infamous for its compassion, outrageous in its standing with the outcast? Why was the church known not for mercy, but for its moralism? So that jubilee of mercy made the embrace of mercy a life or death matter for the church's future. Where there are Christians, Francis has said, people should find an oasis of mercy. And mercy is not simply a theory. It's a way of life. It's a way of living that reflects how God interacts with and saves humanity. That action, as Francis expresses it constantly throughout the Jubilee, was dynamic in four stages. And pay attention, please, not simply to the stage, but to the order of the stages. The first stage, welcoming. And in that close encounter, the second stage, sensing the need of the other. Thirdly, responding concretely and individually, or his famous word, accompanying each person. And the final stage, the final stage, which involves a conversion, change, and full integration. Now, I stress the stages because their order is important. In the past, I think you can argue that we often made the last stage the first, be converted, and then perhaps we can heal you. And finally, we will welcome you. Francis is saying, invert it, welcome, heal, and then invite to conversion. This fourfold move was at the heart of Amoris Laetitiae. You've probably heard about this little letter that he wrote at the end of two, uh, a synod of bishops that stretched over two years. And it underpins, for example, the Vatican's advocacy of, of immigrants. To offer mercy in this way is to evangelize because it performs the way God saves us. It is to experience God. 
There can be no evangelization without mercy because mercy communicates who God is, how God responds to sin and suffering in any form. He does so not by giving a red light or a green light. He does so by being close and concrete. The Jubilee of Mercy wasn't just an indictment of cold moralism, but also the kind of social justice that fails to be close, that speaks of people simply in ideological or statistical terms. Sure, faith without justice makes no sense. Christ could not be separated from the kingdom he was proclaiming. But nor can you or I separate justice from proximity. Poverty, misery, wretchedness are always unique. They seek to conceal themselves, and they can only be revealed through personal contact. And in my way of thinking, that's why Francis has never answered this famous dubia, never has given an unqualified yes or no on the communion question, on the readmission of divorced and remarried people to full Eucharistic communion. Why? Because both, the unqualified yes and the unqualified no, shut out God's grace and the Holy Spirit's freedom of action. The unqualified no by keeping the doors closed, making change hard. The unqualified yes by opening them so wide that there's no need to change. He told clergy in March of 2014 that neither the lax nor the strict priest witnesses to the Christ because neither takes the, seriously the person in front of them. The rigorous nails the person to the law as un understood in a cold and rigid way. The indulgent priest only appears merciful but does not take seriously the problems of that person's conscience, minimizing the sin. Amoris Laetitiae demands closeness, accompaniment, discernment, not taking refuge in abstractions, not making people theories. And I think that's why some hate it. But its authority is not in dispute. It is the fruit of the greatest experience of ecclesial discernment since the Second Vatican Council as well as the Pope's own discernment. In Francis' words, I sincerely believe Jesus wants a church attentive to the goodness which the Holy Spirit sows in the midst of human weakness. And now the final M, margins, which I'd like to begin with my favorite Pope Francis story. Now, I didn't hear it myself, but... Two people who were close to the scene told me it, and I believe them. According to the story, a couple of weeks after Pope Francis was elected, he called the then Secretary of State, Cardinal Tarcisio Bertone, and he said, I want to go to Lampedusa. Now, Lampedusa is an island in the Mediterranean Sea. It's closer to North Africa than it is to Italy. It's part of Italy territorially. It's the destination for boatloads of, of immigrants and refugees. And the waters around Lampedusa are a graveyard of thousands of people, literally, who have died trying to escape misery, war, and persecution in Africa and the Middle East. Well, the Secretary of State tried to talk him out of it. He said, now, Holy Father, you just got elected. It's not a time to travel. You don't even know where the keys are. <laughs> and besides, this will be sort of your first foreign trip. And maybe you'll be sending a message you don't want to send. So why don't you just think about it for a while? Francis said he would. The next week, he called again. And he said, Your Eminence, I want to go to Lampedusa. Well, by now, the Cardinal could see his mind was made up. So having worked over there, Bishop Galanti and I know that if you don't like an idea, you can always delay. <laughs> As one of my colleagues used to say when I worked in the Vatican, Tobin, we live in the eternal city. And everyone sets their watches accordingly. <laughs> <laughs> and so he said, 
we can't plan this trip from one day to the next. I mean, there's logistics and there's security and there's media. Maybe six months, maybe a year. Who knows? So the Pope thanked him. About three weeks later, the Cardinal got a phone call, but it wasn't from the Holy Father. It was from Alitalia, which is the national carrier, air carrier. And it was a vice president, and he sounded a little nervous. And he said, we thought you people would be interested that a passenger by the name of Jorge Bergoglio <laughs> has booked a ticket on the flight from Rome to Lampedusa. <laughs> so the Pope went. <laughs> and this is what he said. It kind of explains partially why he went. When he talked to the people on Lampedusa, he repeated the first two questions that Jesus, uh, excuse me, that God asks after the fall of the human race. The first question, Adam, where are you? And to his son, Cain, where is your brother? But we might well ask a question of Francis, why did you go? Why was of all the priorities this the most important? Reading carefully the joy of the gospel, I think, will understand what the margins mean. And we can expect that he'd offer three reasons why he went. First, his new mission had improved his peripheral vision. As the Archbishop of Buenos Aires, he didn't know any immigrants. Very few Europeans were still coming to Argentina. Paraguayans would, would migrate, but not in the same numbers as the groups that arrived in the 19th and 20th centuries. Certainly didn't know any refugees while he was the Archbishop of Buenos Aires. But his new service in the church broadened his vision. It called him to do what the Second Vatican Council in many different ways asked the church to do, to read the signs of times and places in the light of faith. And this is what he said when he arrived in Lampedusa. When I first heard of the tragedies that are happening here and realized that it happened all too frequently, it has come back to me like a painful thorn in my heart. So Francis might ask us during these days, what do you see when you look out? What pierces your heart? Or maybe a different way. Where is God opening a door for you, for the Diocese of Camden? See, I, I love that question. Where is God opening a door? I get it from the 16th chapter of the Acts of the Apostles, and you, you'll remember, I think, when Paul is on the edge of Europe. He intends to go with his companions to the north. And twice in the 16th chapter of Acts it says, but the Spirit blocked him, or the Spirit of Jesus wouldn't let him go. And then he has a dream one night of a man dressed in Macedonian dress, saying, come help us. And he knew where he had to go. It wasn't to the north, it was to the west. And they crossed into Philippi. And the first Christian community was formed in Europe. Why this question is so important for us is that if God is opening a door, then we'll have what we need to go through. The problem is when we start with the resource question. What do you have? I don't know. What do you have? Worst question, what do you want to do? Rather than the sort of discernment that lets us answer that question. Where is God opening a door? So he Francis knew that God was calling him to the peripheries. The periphery of really the world was Lampedusa. Secondly, in going there, he would have to practice what he preaches. 
In the joy of the gospel, he insists that the needed conversion today in the church is a missionary conversion. It is the reevaluation of all church structures and activities so that mission, the outreach to people in the love of Jesus, is clearly the first priority. Sometimes the Pope calls it a pastoral conversion, but the emphasis is always on mission, on going out. And he doesn't exempt himself from this change of heart. He said, since I'm called to put into practice what I ask of others, I too must think about a conversion of the papacy. It is my duty as Bishop of Rome to be open to suggestions which can help make the exercise of my ministry more faithful to the meaning which Jesus Christ wishes to give it and our present need of evangelization. No less than all the members of the church, the Pope would not be constrained by the shackles of custom or pragmatism. Put another way, we've always done it this way. Thirdly, he went to find the suffering face of Christ. Brothers and sisters, all of us are called to offer others an explicit witness to the saving love of the Lord, who despite our imperfections, offers us his closeness, his word, his strength, and gives meaning to our lives. The joy of the gospel insists that our response of love to Jesus' love of us and our willingness to share that love with others is the most important reality in our lives. Not just when we're doing something religious. Are there things in your life, worries or pressures or distractions or habits that blot out your awareness of your life in Christ much of the time? What can you do about it? I think that this Sometimes the teaching of Francis is hard for us as Americans because as Americans we want results. We expect results. And through sheer effort, whether it's with our bootstraps or the sweat of our brow, we can produce results. It reminds me of my favorite guillotine joke. I have a couple, but this is my favorite. <laughs> it's about prisoners being executed during the French Revolution on the central square in Paris, the Place de Concorde. And the first prisoner to be thrust under the blade was an Italian. And they dropped the blade and it stopped inches from his neck. And the people all proclaimed, miracle, miracle, let him go, let him free. So he was freed. The second was a German. The same result, the same cry from the people, let him go, let him go. And the third was an American. And as he was being led over to the guillotine, he looked up and he said, you know, if you tighten the bolts on this thing, it'll work. <laughs> we like results, but we may not always think through. <laughs> so Francis says, and this is encouraging for us in the joy of the gospel, today's obsession with immediate results makes it hard for pastoral workers to tolerate anything that smacks of disagreement, possible failure, criticism, the cross. And so the biggest threat of all gradually takes place. What do you think it is? Some, sometimes in North Jersey, I think it's the, the Newark Star Ledger. <laughs> but it's not. It's what Francis quotes, the great pragmatism of daily life in the church in which all seems to be proceeding normally, while in reality, faith is wearing down and degenerating into small-mindedness. And if we're afraid of making mistakes or simply want a faith that comforts us, you know, me and Jesus. One of my friends likes to say, if it's me and Jesus only, it's mainly me. Francis would say in the joy of the gospel, more than a fear of going astray, my hope is that we will be moved by the fear of remaining shut up within structures, within structures which give us a false sense of security, within rules that make us hard judges, within habits that make us feel safe, 
while at our door people are starving and Jesus does not tire of us of saying to us, give them something to eat. So I'm almost wrapping it up. I never say in conclusion because as someone once observed, second wind is what happens when a bishop says in conclusion. <laughs> I think there are three convictions that unite the program of Francis as expressed in the joy of the gospel. First of all, Francis wants to say what the gospel proclaims. And above all, it says that we are loved by God. Each one of us personally and us together as a community. Mercy. A second burning conviction of the joy of the gospel is that the encounter with Christ changes us because it wakes us up to the astonishing fact that we are God's beloved. It unites us to our brother Jesus, and it turns us in love and respectful concern towards the world. We become missionary disciples. Mission. And finally, the third burning con conviction of that letter is about how centrally the Lord of the gospel be belongs to the poor, with the poor, the afflicted, the excluded, and ignored in our over-busy, success-addicted world, margins. So I began this reflection citing one Jesuit, and I cited him quite a bit going through, name of Francis, Jorge Bergoglio. I think it's only fair that I cite a cardinal, even though the brand may not be what it once was. Nearly nine years ago, Pope Benedict XVI beatified John Henry Cardinal Newman. Last February, Pope Francis approved his canonization, though the date of that great event still has to be set. Now, you know Newman was a prodigious scholar, a masterful preacher, an astute spiritual guide. In 1849, he addressed the theme, the prospects of a Catholic missioner at the inauguration of a missionary community in London. In his talk, he, ta he addressed the reality of that vast city as a mass of solitary individuals where no one knows his next door neighbor and each one pursues her own interests and of a culture which, like ocean, closes over every attempt made to influence and impress it. I don't know. Do you think he could have been describing a be bewildered Facebook America? Yet he says that at the most inauspicious time, Peter, a Galilean fisherman, entered Rome. Such has been the case throughout the centuries in the examples he cites. Then Newman concludes, it is no new thing then with the church in a time of confusion or anxiety when the enemy is at her gates that her children, far from being dismayed, but rather glorying in the, the, the danger as vigorous men and women exult in trials of their strength, go forth to do her work as though she were in the most palmy days of her prosperity. Says Newman, we Catholics do not know when we are beaten. We advance when by all rules of war we ought to retreat. My brothers and sisters, we advance because we know the one who has called us to be with him and sends us forth to preach. The same one who called Francis to Rome. The same one who calls Francis to Lampedusa the same one who calls us to announce the good words in New Jersey. Thank you. God bless you. Well, thank you so very, very much. Thanks. Thank you. Not so well, much. Well, thank you. Cardinal, thank you so much for those inspiring words. Let us remember 
mission, a way of being, mercy, a way of living, and margins, the consciousness of those people who are in our peripheral vision. In following our theme of making sure that we're able to tell our stories and we're able to bring our stories to others as a way of getting to know people, I'd like to invite up our next witness speakers. From St. Peter's Parish in Merchantville, Kathy and Mike O'Callaghan. Hi, Mike and Kathy O'Callaghan. Uh, we've been married for coming up on 23 years now uh, in June. Uh, we were engaged for about a year and we dated for less than a year before we got engaged. We have uh, three children. Our oldest is an 18-year-old, uh, Chris, at DeSales University. Our second is a sophomore at Camden Catholic High School, Mary Kate. And our youngest is 13. He is an eighth grader at St. Peter's School in Merchantville. And the reason we're here today to talk to you uh, about marriage is that, um, for those of you that don't know, my brother is Father Rob Sinatra. And he is the, uh, one of the, the unofficial host, I guess, of the Talking Catholic podcast team. So they were trying to do, uh, they were doing a podcast on marriage, and my wonderful brother volunteered us to do it. And so I guess it went well, so here we are. Um, but in case it doesn't go well, he's right in the front. <laughs> <laughs> Feel free to blame him totally, um, right? But that's what we do um, as Catholics. We rope our family members into service because that's what we do as Catholics. We, you know, we live our faith and we do it together. I work for St. Peter's School and every school event, it, we're all in. Our kids are in, Mike is in, um, you know, we all do it together. Uh, and as part of our parish, we're involved as well. So uh, Mike and I are both extraordinary ministers. I'm a lector, um, Ryan's an altar server, our kids are in um, choir, and we also teach pre-cana. So our talk in pre-cana is about communication and marriage. Um, and faith is a big piece of that talk. Uh, we both grew up in pretty strong Catholic families, so um, when we met, we already were pretty faithful. Um, when we first got married, things were pretty easy for us. You know, we'd wake up in the morning on a Saturday and say, hey, what do you want to do today? Let's go mountain biking. Let's just go on a day trip. Uh, things changed five years later when we had our son. Chris is developmentally delayed. The first two years of his life, we slept in shifts. Um, he couldn't be left alone, and everybody told us, you know, this is what you got to do. But no two people had the same answer. <clears throat> One day, uh, I came home from work, and she'd had a real bad day with Chris. So I took him, and she grabbed this free magazine that came in the mail. One we normally would just throw away. Uh, about, you know, 10, 15 minutes later, she comes back out, and our prayers were answered. The uh, featured article was about early intervention. We believe You're good. we got that, art, that uh, magazine to answer our prayers. And we trusted it. And it, would, it proved to be right. Um, had a few bumps with Chris along the way. But he was able to enter high school as a typically developing child. Today he's at uh, the Sales University and doing great. Um, when we talk to married couples and to be married couples, we try to tell them that they have to trust the signs and trust that God will answer them. Um, if most people, they, you know, they'll ask God what they want, but they don't listen to when he's talking back to you and giving you the answer. Our uh, journey with Chris kind of prepared us for our next tough thing in life, and that was uh, about four and a half years ago when I got cancer. Um, so fortunately... Uh, we, they caught it really early, and um, you know, Mike is great and in recovery now, um, cancer free. But it was a really rough um, seven weeks for him, uh, seven weeks of treatment. So he had radiation every day and two um, rounds of chemo. Yeah, they, would, uh, they made like a mask, like a hockey mask, bowled them into a table, and the machine went around, gave me radiation. So, you know, I said to Mike, how do you, you know, how do you do it? How are you? you know, dealing with this. And, you know, without hesitation, 
He said, well, the rosary. So when he was in radiation every day, he prayed the rosary. And I just found that so inspiring, and that's, you know, such a testament to Mike, because I know, you know, he is a man of tremendous faith, and, um, you know, he inspires me to be a better Catholic. And I, I was able to focus on my health, because I knew she could take care of the family and keep him strong. So, um, a couple things we've implemented um, as a family is we have, you know, a few rules. So the first rule that we have, um, really for more Mike and I, is the 24-hour rule. So you have 24 hours to air any grievance that you might have. So if Mike did something to me, I have 24 hours to get it off my chest. If, and if I don't do it in 24 hours, like, that's it. I lost my chance. Ship <laughs> that ship sailed. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, we joke about it, but really it's, it's, it's a healthy way to be so that, you know, I, if I had the problem, I get it out, um, we Things apologize, and then we move on. So the second one that we have is a particular favorite. It's something that I developed called the House of Kindness. And uh, this is one that we do really as a, as a whole family. And the way that it started is, you know, I was just so tired, and I'm sure, as you all are, of the mean, right? There's so much mean out there. And it's really easy to make fun of the ones that we love, because we know them so well, and we know they'll still love us. Um, so I came up with this concept called the House of Kindness. So in our house, if somebody says something mean, uh, unkind, you know, crosses the line, we completely call them out on it. And they have to say, I apologize because this is the house of kindness. <laughs> and our kids hate it. <laughs> and whenever they uh, get called out for it, we conveniently cannot hear them when they apologize. That's so they right. have to so keep doing it. Say it again. Um, and really loud. And feel free to use this. Like, it also spills into the car of kindness. Um, <laughs> you know. Or teachers, you can use it as the classroom of kindness. Um, but one of the main reasons I did it was because you know, I wanted our home to be that one place, you know, where you feel loved and appreciated and cared for. Um, because if you want to be insulted, right, walk outside. Because you can find so many people that are, you know, Johnny on the spot to make you feel less of a person. And I wanted to make sure um, that we, that's just not tolerated in our home. You know, because, you know, Mike's my go-to guy. You know, he's, he's my everything. And I respect him so much, and so when I speak to him, I want him to feel good about himself. Um, and it's really my job to make him the best man, the best Catholic, you know, that he can be, and um, I take that very seriously. I, I want to lift him up, you know, to be the best person that he can be. So, um, in conclusion, our uh, faith, it's woven into every part of our life, including and especially our marriage. Um, we just like to thank you for letting us share our little story. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Hey, thank you. At this time, I'm going to turn uh, the stage back over to Josh and to Cardinal. We have about 15 minutes. Uh, for questions. So we are going to take questions. The uh, number will be coming up. And um, thank you very much. Okay. It's such a beautiful example of how uh, close proximity of persons um, that Mike and Kathy shared leads to such beautiful uh, unity of marriage. It's a beautiful example of what Cardinal Tobin was speaking about in terms of the closeness and the fruit of that. So thank you. I'm just going to ask one question because I want all of you to be asking your questions now to Mike. And he will be uh, uh, speaking those forth so we can uh, present them to the Cardinal. I want to start with one question, though, and there's a bit of irony in this question here, because it's an American results-oriented question about just dwelling with Christ. So the last day or so has been so full of um, enthusiasm, unity, and joy, and I can feel among the conversations that we want to get out and do something. And Yet what you share with us is that this first stage of missionary discipleship is simply being conscious that Jesus has called me to be with him and to dwell with him. 
So if I can ask this question as a good American, results-oriented, Cardinal, how do, how do we do that? What are some ways that we can turn off all the distraction and simply respond to that call to dwell with Jesus, to be with him, because he's called us to be with him? Well, I think, you know, there, there certainly is the, uh, you know, the, the great means of being with Jesus is in prayer. Mm-hmm. But it doesn't have to always be speaking a lot of mm-hmm. prayers. I suspect one of the attractions of Eucharistic adoration, especially among young people today, is that they also can just sit with him, mm-hmm. you know. And, but it, there are other ways that are, I think, a little more difficult, at least for Mother Tobin's oldest boy, um, and that's in the circumstances of life. Mm-hmm. You may have heard that um, Pope Francis asked the bishops of the country to make a retreat, uh, and we did it the uh, day after uh, New Year's, uh, the 2nd to the 8th of January, and the seminary of, uh, in Chicago, in Mundelein. We had a Franciscan uh, Capuchin, actually, who uh, gave the conferences, and one that really struck me, and he was talking about being with Jesus, but he said, what does it mean to be with Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane? And that wasn't on my program of things to do list, you know. But as he began to describe it, he talked about the experience of Jesus as the scripture reveals it, and it Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane became sin. His suffering was that, that sins of which he was guilty of none, he was carrying. And that experience led him away from his father. So he felt abandoned. He didn't know what to make of it. And yet he brought himself in all of his humanity to profess not my will but your will be done Mm -hmm. and I think you know hearing that in the context of the suffering of the people of God and you know in trying to make sense of my own life you know as the as the Archbishop of Newark Mm -hmm. I realize that now I'm I have plenty of sin that I've committed you know and please God been forgiven for but the stuff I'm carrying I haven't done I don't think I've ever abused anybody except on the hockey rink, and they weren't minors, you know. Um, I've not covered things up, but I'm carrying that. And the knowledge then, as a fruit of that conference, that that suffering is united with Christ's suffering. It's trying to be Christ-like in Gethsemane. Help me realize in a new way that I hadn't thought of before how it is to be with Jesus. So I think, yeah, I still get up early in the morning and I try and spend some quiet time with the Lord. But at night when I'm discouraged, I think, you know, uh, I, yeah, I, I think I should have done something else with my life. I realize, I realize that this is, this is what it means to be with him. So what, what you're telling us, if I hear you, is that we go to our Lord in prayer. That's a beautiful way to yeah. be with him. But that for you as cardinal, you're also being with Christ when you're sharing suffering. Suffering not that you committed, but suffering that's been yeah. once it's burdened upon you. You're shouldered with that. And that's a way of intimacy with Christ. And it perhaps is. a new way. Because you try and do what he did. Mm-hmm. And say, you know, Father, you know... Ultimately, the prayer is, into your hands I commend my spirit, mm-hmm. all that I have. Okay. Yeah. Oh, wonderful. Um, is there a question to Tom? As he's queuing that up. I'm ready. I'm right, ready. Yes. No, I'm right. <laughs> so, Cardinal, could you please give us some tips or icebreakers for bringing the word of missionary discipleship to those who need to serve? Could you went a little slower? A little slower, okay. Missionary disciples. Can you, can you give us some tips or some icebreakers for bringing the word of missionary discipleship to those who need to serve? Well, I think one is that Christian, you know, being a disciple is not a spectator sport. You know, that we don't sit up in the stands and watch other people. Or not like a friend of mine who was a sports writer 
who said, you know, what sports writers es essentially are like the cavalry that is on the mountaintop while the battle is going on below, <laughs> and afterwards they go down and shoot the wounded. You know, the, uh, <laughs> I, I, th I think it's the acceptance of vocation that, you know, that my, my vocation isn't simply to spend an hour in church on Sunday. When people ask me, well, what do you think is the biggest crisis the church faces today? I think it's this. It's the separation of faith from life. It's not any of the hot button issues we want to talk about. We can talk about those too, but uh, it really is that somehow my faith is compartmentalized from who I am. Uh, I like to tell the story of the priest who's reading his breviary on a plane flight and uh, the, the, the flight attendant comes out of the cockpit, ashen-faced, and she announces, ladies and gentlemen, the pilot is unable to get the landing gear to descend, so we're going to have to make an emergency landing. Please assume the crash position. And the priest sh shuts his breviary, slams it shut, and says, oh my God, I better pray. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, the notion is... It's, it's not, a, it, it's not a, a call for, you know, willy-nilly, chicken with my head off activism, but it's to realize that my life with God penetrates all that I do. And the more I can close that gap, I think the happier and the freer I'm going to be. <laughs> so good, funny stories also help us icebreakers, as you've shown <laughs> us. <laughs> Actually, you know, I think Jesus uh, tells a lot of funny stories, but we just, you know, because it's a different context. It goes over our head. Over our but, uh, yeah. Another question. Certainly. Where can we look to see examples of being neither too relaxed nor too strict? Perhaps, ironically, how do we hold ourselves accountable to this balance? Well, I believe that the worst thing that can happen to somebody is to live a tension-free existence. Now let me be clear, there's a tension that is destructive. It's like the tension that destroys buildings during an earthquake. The movement of the Earth's crust produces a tension in that building that finally can't resist and it, it crumbles. But without tension, I can't speak if I don't have tension in my vocal cords. I can't sing. Uh, I can't walk if I don't have tension in my spinal column. So there's a tension that's creative, like a finely tuned guitar. And having said that, I, I, I'll share with you what I, I told a, my confessor a couple years ago. You know, I used to think that my struggle, my spiritual struggle, uh, the thorn in my flesh that I keep asking the Lord to re remove was sort of garden variety concupiscence. But... Uh, the longer I live, I realize that's the tension, to f live a balanced life. And I don't think that there is any way to do it without tension. You just have to keep doing it to get it right. But I do believe if the focus becomes too much on me, then I have to conjugate that with what the Master says in many different ways. The one who seeks to save her life will lose it. Whereas the one who loses her life for my sake saves it, discovers it. Or there's no greater love than this to, than to lay down one's life for their friends. I think every parent knows that. I'm not a parent, but you know, I have one. I have two, actually. <laughs> and, uh, my mother, who's 96, we just celebrated her birthday last week. She told you know, she used to go to a daily mass with our dad uh, at six o'clock and on the southwest side of Detroit, and she used to look around at all these after a really tough night with a sick child or something. She'd see all these little old ladies in church and say, "Why aren't you asleep?" <laughs> she says, "Now she understands." <laughs> but the point was. She maintained that tension in her life, you know, the, the need for rest, yes, the need but also to care for a child and the need to, 
to nourish yourself spiritually. So I'm going to get her to write it down and figure out how to do it right. Another question. Yeah, we have one, one more. I feel that gay people are part of the marginalized. How do we reach out to and include those people who are oftentimes do not feel accepted in the Catholic Church? Yeah. Well, at first, I think the most important thing to do is give them a face so that you know them for who they are. Not that you just see them. You know, I, I, this was taught to me in a very graphic way when I was a young priest. I used to do a lot of work in a spiritual movement called Corsillo. Most of them in Spanish, but occasionally in English in an ecumenical Corsillo expression. And I remember working with an African-American guy in Detroit on the team. His name, I can tell you his name. His name was Oliver Washington III, and known to his friends as Ollie. And Ali said to me during our preparation for the Curcio, he said, Joe, do you love me? I said, sure, I love you, Ali. He said, does my being black have anything to do with it? I said, no, 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 no. I don't even see that, thinking that was the proper answer. And he said, looked at me, he said, but that's my point. Can you love me as a black man? And I saw what he said, because then I saw his face. Not just what he looked like, but his history and uh, his experience in the church and, and everything else. And I think that the first thing we can do, especially with folks around the margin, is give them a face or at least have the humility to recognize their face when they show it to us and not some sort of concept or box that we want to put them in. In other words, it's moving the rock like Jesus ordered the, the men to do so Lazarus could come out and not reverse it by putting him in and pushing the rock of prejudice or prejudging in front of it. So I think that, you know, the, that's the most important first step in the culture of encounter that Francis calls us to. So one last question. When you celebrate Mass, why does the bishop, why doesn't the bishop take off his own hat? Oh, jeez. <laughs> All right. Where is that? It's, it's my sidekick, Father Jason Tull. This, this was a, an extremely traumatic moment in my life, all right? I, last winter at the Cathedral of the Sacred Heart in Newark, I was coming down the aisle and I saw a little girl waving to me. And so I knelt down next door and I said, what's up? And she was about five years old, you know, and she just froze me with her look. There was somewhere between deep disappointment and utter disgust. <laughs> and she asked, why don't you take off your own hat? I said, I don't know. <laughs> Thanks, Thank you very, very much. Good. Thanks, you've been great. Thanks, David. Well, thank you so very much. God bless you. Thanks for having us here. Josh, thank you for facilitating that conversation. Thank you so much.